So what you'd see if the PowerPoint was up was a woman uh, looking at a collection of Barbie dolls. And the argument that I'm going to make today, that what's going on in her head is much more important than the usual topics that you might hear in this very room, that her decision of whether or not to buy a Barbie stands for whether or not she wants to lead the sort of lives that we need Chinese middle class people to start leading. We need her to buy Barbies, we need her to buy cars, we need her to buy everything that you can possibly think of. Go home, look around your house, that's what we need her to do. So I'm going to suggest that what's going on in her head, that the, uh, that her, the making of this desire to have Barbie uh, dolls is the most important um, force uh, changing China. So next slide here uh, would be a collection of lots of data about China that I've pulled from the internet. All sorts of graphs and sort of things that you'd see if, if I were a proper economist giving this talk. And the argument that I make about all that data is that even with all of that, with all of that information uh, flooding us from China, uh, that it's very easy to get misled into what are the most important stories. Or more importantly, it's easy to see these, uh, these different data points as unrelated stories. I think that this most important force, this force of trying to get China to move from this export-oriented economy where they're relying on you all and our American friends uh, to consume, to drive global economic growth as well as drive Chinese growth um, behind this story, uh, that a lot of, uh, a lot of geo global politics, a lot of uh, economic developments are all riding on what's going on uh, in her, her, her head. Uh, those more astute China observers will usually, and just in case I forget, I should point out, yes, I'm aware that the Barbie store, the five-story emporium on Huaihai Road in central Shanghai, in the old French concession, is now, uh, fortunately, their business model didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to. So no more opportunities to go in for a consultation on how you two can look more like Barbie. Um, I'll get back to that. So that's not all that data that I was suggesting to you. I want to suggest that an easier way to capture all this complexity of the last 25 years is a historical uh, 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 is through history. So how do we do that? Given all that complex information that we see coming out of China, I want to suggest that we can capture this through my own hairstyle and personal grooming. Uh, 25, well, 25, more like uh, 42 years ago, this is roughly how I would have had my hair cut bowl would be dropped on head and have snip, snip, snip around me. What does this have to do with the most important forces uh, changing the world? Well, I believe that you can see the same sort of transformation in China. China went from being the land of the incredibly bad haircut to the land that I now wait. You're probably thinking maybe I'm waiting to go to China soon since I need a haircut. Uh, uh, the land that you go to for really good haircuts. Um, indeed, this sort of captures one dimension of the changes in these last few years. You don't need to read the fine print below there. I put that up for my own cheating purposes. But largely it says that, that once upon a time when I started going to China 25 years ago, if you wanted a haircut, you had to go to the center of town, uh, to really horrible places, you know, those bare cement floors, people that kept bankers' hours, no offense to bankers in here, uh, <laughs> uh, and had a very bad uh, consumer sort of experience. Flash forward uh, 25 years, and now it's the land of not only the best haircut, but it's a land where 11 million plus Chinese people spend all day, every day, thinking about people's nails, their hair, their feet, and so on. Uh, and that this represents, this is one way, one, I am going to argue, key way of capturing all that data point can be reduced to seeing this trend of transition of how China went from once upon a time being the land of the crappy haircut uh, to the sort of place that it is now where it's the fifth largest industry in China. Um, I want to then argue that all the sort of stories that we usually hear about in newspapers on the left, seemingly in sequence, I used to half-jokingly say every time one of our major newspapers uh, sent a new reporter out to Beijing, this is almost the sequence that we get the stories from them out of. Uh, something about Chinese military budgets, when I made this list, there was a big to-do about Chinese military spending, especially on do they have stealth technology, might they have it soon. Soaring energy demands. There's a new Ai Weiwei every year. His name will be forgotten. Well, we will probably remember less about him in one year because he'll be displaced by another blind, self-educated uh, lawyer type. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that any of these stories aren't important. Uh, I'm just suggesting that as we go through these uh, stories, we think about the way these are dangled in front of us. Uh, they're more, less important than what I'm going to suggest over in the right column, that even in the lead up to who's going to succeed Boishila, uh, whoops, <laughs> who's going to succeed Hu Jintao, 
um, and now with the purging of Boise Lai, um, that even these sort of stories um, are, are less important than the dramatic transformation <coughs> going on within China, that is the Chinese people beginning to lead these new lifestyles, these new consumer-oriented lifestyles, uh, and the international implications of that are changing everything. Um, when you write a book with a uh, publisher suggested title, How Chinese Consumers Are Transforming, not just one or two things, but everything, once, a, once in a while you're challenged by that. I stand by the subtitle of that because I believe that what's being transformed is everything from this, your subjective experience of the world through your consciousness, which in consumer societies is defined by brands, namely which kind of car you drive, uh, what sort of watch you wear, suit you own, whatever. Uh, uh, so your ex subjective experience of the world to your objective environment you live in, namely the biosphere, that all of those things and everything in between is being impacted by this dramatic transformation of the rise of uh, Chinese uh, consumerism. Um, what I want to uh, argue about today, since I said it's something about my personality, then rather than talking about all the wonderful brands that China is going to uh, contribute to the world and how they're going to give Sony, well, they're already giving Sony a run for their money, or Apple, or so on, uh, that there are uh, lots of irresolvable contradictions between our desire to see them emulate us, uh, to me represented by the selection of drinks there on the left, and, and any one of a number of... Uh, local convenience stores to the implications of that, um, of them leading those kind of lifestyles. But before I get to that, I want to briefly remind, again, no need to read these anecdotes, these uh, quotations. The quotations basically uh, are examples of world leaders, both within China uh, and outside of China, both in the economic sphere and in the political sphere, who are all saying that the way we need to save the world is to get Chinese to consume more. Uh, in the aftermath of 2008, there was quite a bit of browbeating and that the Chinese need to step up and do their part, that the world economic crisis wouldn't last nearly as long as if the Chinese stopped having this, uh, stopped having this export-oriented regime and started allowing uh, their consumers to live these much more Western-style lives. Their, uh, their, the percentage of, the, of GDP devoted to infrastructure uh, would go down and the percentage devoted to personal consumption uh, would go up. Chinese savings rates would go down um, and again, global economic growth would uh, develop. This is the global consensus, whether again, you're inside of China or outside of China. Um, so I, I then want to ask them, what are the contradictions between looking for China to save the world economically by driving a new round of economic development versus what are the kind of offsetting problems that will be created um, along the way, uh, most, uh, most conspicuously um, uh, the environment. So here are some of the ways that I try to address this gigantic uh, problem. I'll briefly mention some of the things that I included here, and then we can talk about any or none of those as you see fit. I'll talk about cars briefly as a case study in a minute. Uh, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. For those of you who think, well, he's going to talk about cars, I can check my Blackberry or whatever people use here. Um, I, I want to say that CARS stands for almost any industry that you can think of in China. The same reason why China went from having virtually no personal cars a couple of decades ago to as of 2009 having the world's largest car market, both in terms of manufacturing, in other words, they produce more for the world than anybody else, as well as uh, consumption, 13 plus million units, um, also applies to many other industries, why China developed all of those as well. Uh, so again, even if you're not interested in cars so much, uh, the same way that China went for, to being a global leader in consumption and production in that industry applies to almost any industry uh, that we can think of. The new rich is a pretty topical subject, uh, since those of us who are interested in political instability uh, think quite, uh, quite a bit about how China can go from being such an equal and egalitarian society to being one of the most unequal in, in just a few decades. My central point of that chapter is to look at this, this tension between the love-hate relationship towards the new rich in China. Love them because they represent the aspirations of uh, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a TV program hosted by a guy who could have been British, Australian, I can't tell the difference at that age, <laughs> I think he maybe was Australian, called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, where he'd walk around and show you how the rich people lived. I think there's endless numbers of these same sorts of things in China going on now. So pumping in the idea of this is what the good life uh, is like. You go on vacations to places like Ireland, you have this kind of car, this kind of house, and so on. So you have that on the one hand, that's the love part of the relationship. The hate part of the relationship is the resentment that the only way that they'll ever have that kind of life um, is through connections. 
that if you're not born into the right family and, and politically connected, then your chances of having those, those kind of lifestyles are much uh, slimmer. Uh, you can imagine that that's uh, the same in many parts of the world as inequality grows. But what about in a country that still calls itself socialist, that has a living memory of a different way of doing, doing things? What sort of social tensions will come out of that? I personally think that the problem's not going to come from the tens of thousands of disturbances that, we, that the Chinese government used to um, report about up until recently. Um, these disturbances are usually essentially land disputes in the countryside. Land has been stolen by eminent domain to create an industrial park or something, or indirectly by allowing the nephew of the local party secretary to pollute at his factory so much so that it renders the land around it useless. I think that's much less uh, of a problem than the millions of of kids who have uh, gone now to these, in some cases, private universities who can't get jobs, the ant tribe people that we hear about. These are the ones in Chinese history that usually cause the problem, namely the people on the outside who want to be the inside, who feel like the mechanism from going from the outside to the inside is fixed against them, so that even if they're brighter, harder working, and all those other things, they can't get in. Um, new ta Made in Taiwan uh, chapter is a bit about how China could have gone from this land of bad haircut to the land of great haircuts in such a short period of time. And this is, of course, the overseas Chinese diaspora, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and other places uh, that funded so much that allowed China to go from this land of bad haircut to the land of good one. My brother is an investment banker, uh, and I have a feeling that him and perhaps some of you would feel much less comfortable about an assignment in Shanghai uh, if you had gone to the Shanghai that I experienced uh, 25 years ago, as opposed to the one now with the nice hotels and restaurants. So I say they not only jump-start it for Chinese consumers, for the, uh, uh, but they also jump-start it for uh, uh, making it easier for China to absorb FDI, that there's much nicer places to go. So I look at the role of Taiwan in that. It's why it's been obvious for a while that, uh, that, that any thoughts of Taiwan independence, my Taiwanese friends don't like it when I say this, uh, seem pretty hard to imagine given that the, uh, so many Chinese entrepreneurs in Taiwan are making all of their money in mainland China as well. Uh, retailing and branding, unless you're a business type, sounds like pretty boring kinds of topics. Uh, but if you're interested in the development of consumerism in China, and as I suggested, that you create your identity and you share that identity through the brands that you buy, then uh, branding and retailing is very important for China. How, do, how, for instance, do you standardize the consumer experience? So shopping in one high-end place and buying one well-known brand in one place is the same as in another place. So I look at these waves of China, uh, of China in the reform era from the first, the dismantling the state-owned enterprises, the, re -emer the emergence of mom and pop shops, uh, and, and the consolidation of those, and now the attempts by China to not allow uh, uh, better capitalized multinationals to sweep in and, and uh, take, uh, take off their hands uh, what they had done, namely the force of, uh, forcible consolidation of these, um, of these national chains. Um, I can get back to that afterwards. Branding consumer consciousness is directly related to my first and much more academic work about economic nationalism in China. One of the takeaways, I suppose, for a business crowd of this, and I'll talk about this a bit with, the, with cars, is that China is not just happy being at the bottom end of the value chain, not surprisingly. They're not happy just with low-wage labor work stuffing Disney toys, as it were, as opposed to owning uh, Disney and owning the brands, managing brand management. I suspect people here who are in brand management or equivalent professions are making slightly more than people uh, stuffing uh, Disney toys. Uh, I hope so. You should suggest as much. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in the ways that the Chinese state is picking winners and losers in the branding, uh, branding wars and how that's not only linked to some sort of economic nationalism, but that critical issue I talked about earlier of getting jobs for those millions of unemployed college kids. That those, those kids represent not just an economic problem, we need to move up the value chain, get them better jobs, but also a political problem as well. So with each of these topics, I'll then talk about or get you to think about how these things all have political and much larger repercussions than just something uh, to do with economics or business. These last three are the particularly grim chapters. Uh, these are the chapters that I feel uh, suggest that uh, we're, China, we're not just up here with world's best practices and everything we can think of, uh, <clears throat> democracy, markets, uh, apple pie production, whatever it is, and China is down here ever so slowly making its way in this direction. But there seems to me, and this is again a contestable point, quite a bit of convergence in any number of areas. 
One of these areas to me is living in a world of fakes. That the experience of being in the consumer in the Chinese market is a pretty bad one. Why? Because you're never sure whether something is fake or or the genuine article. Um, I believe that that's already spilling out to. I don't believe. I know that's already spilling out into global markets. Uh, in Africa, a huge number, a percentage of pharmaceuticals are fakes that are likely either to be inert and then kill you because they don't solve whatever medical problem you have, or are poisonous. This problem isn't just restricted to Africa. So I, I believe that this is not only a question of uh, undermining uh, branded markets uh, within China, but also uh, globally. Furthermore, I guess this is the historian bit in me. If you believe, as I do, that consumerism means you structure identity around the consumption of branded objects, what does it mean if I can't convey I'm rich because I have Swiss watch that you can't pronounce, as opposed to polar heart rate monitor that you can pronounce? Um, how, how does that change the, the society, uh, the era that we're living in when brands no longer communicate uh, what they had previously? Extreme markets for me is this uh, attempt to look at how what was successfully or largely banned in the communist period is now reemerged with a vengeance. So things like uh, markets for um, liver, for or organ tourism, um, uh, 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 consumption of endangered species, notably sharks. So how Chinese consumption of sharks are destroying stocks of, uh, of destroying species of sharks halfway half a world away. Um, sale of uh, children, uh, import and export of brides, both into and out of China, and then from richer to poorer parts of China. Um, I look at all of those things, and the, the point that I'm trying to make about convergence of markets is uh, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War rhetoric in which freedom was equated with freedom in the marketplace. One of the ways you knew you were free was because you had the ability to buy and sell whatever you wanted in a free marketplace. I think China, in some ways, to my mind, takes that to its logical extreme. Now, how free are you if I can't buy your liver and have it for dinner? Maybe not so free after all. Uh, this, this is the not on the record part, right? <laughs> um, anyway, you take the, take the point that what we see in China is in some cases, um, uh, especially as an American who, who has to listen to endless amounts of how the market can do absolutely no wrong, why those people, I think, are not familiar with the markets in China and what wrongs they might in fact be doing. Finally, there's the environmental implications, which I'll talk about in the context um, of cars. Um, so right, let me then shift to talking in a little bit more detail before we have discussion about this to um, Chinese cars. So the, the question here uh, then, again, is how did China go from being the land of no private cars to the largest market uh, both for personal cars as well as a uh, global producer of cars just in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, I think the reasons why um, Chinese people want cars, um, some of it's pretty obvious. I mean, we, if we all closed our eyes and thought about why we like cars, I suspect that would have picked the cars, you know, have a couple of things on the list there. Uh, air conditioning, I don't like to get rain down, I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't take my magic carpet over here from the other side of town, you know, in the rain. Uh, you can go through all, all of these sorts of things. It's understandable, the individual desire to want to have a car. Uh, but one of the things that I want to contest in this uh, book and in my talk uh, is the idea that um, once the evil Chinese state gets out of the way, DNA kicks in and nature takes its course and next thing you know, everybody wants a car. Um, I don't think there's anything inevitable or automatic um, about it. Um, I think instead that we need to think about the massive role of the state in pushing people into cars. Um, I have put some stuff, again, those people in the corner who can't see this, I'll just explain what I think are the important uh, bits anyway. So once upon a time, the centers of cities of China, of China used to be mixed use meaning you live and work in the same, uh, roughly the same area. If you work for a state-owned enterprise, then it's like being part of an Oxford college. Everything is provided for you, and there's almost no reason to leave uh, the walls. Uh, you get your housing, your uh, uh, education for your kids. Everything was taken care of in the same place in the centers of town. Those have all been uh, privatized. Um, and replaced with an acronym that I hadn't heard before going to China 20, 10 years ago or so, CBD. Everyone's talking about CBD and central business districts and the relationship of the property that they were spec speculating on to the CBD would determine in a very efficient market manner how much the property was worth. 
Um, so if the state has privatized all of those things, has consciously created CBDs, what's happened to all the people that used to live in what's now called the CBD? Well, they're pushed out of the centers of city, pushed into the um, outer lying areas, or they go of their own free will because they want a 6,000 square foot house with an American style backyard for their dog and 2.3 children, which they've had somewhat illegally so they could get around it. Uh, or they have leisure homes or, uh, or, or so on. So what, what that first one, and I could give plenty of other examples of this, is an example of which once upon a time, maybe you didn't need a car if you were, lived and worked in the same place as I do. I don't need one in Oxford, I don't have one. Uh, to starting to need, um, uh, to need uh, a, a car. Um, I, again, I don't think there's uh, much of an uh, accident around this. During the 90s, although now China is now known for building this massive um, underground network, a railway network, it had underfunded, as it was doing all this, it was underfunding mass transportation. So again, it was increasing the need for people to have cars. Uh, the state on the lower right corner can do lots of different things, uh, lower tariffs. Uh, it can uh, for, allow banks to lend money to uh, people that want to buy cars. Uh, it can tweak, it can do all sorts of things to make it easier for people to start buying or owning cars. But for me, the most important story of all of this is the early 1990s. Again, all of this being the question of how China went from having no cars to the world's largest car demand as well as uh, uh, production. All of that boils down to the lower left corner, if you had to pick one of these things. It's membership in the WTO in the early 1990s. The decision to join WTO, and again, this will be reproduced in industry after industry, um, sets off a very small window between China's decision to join the WTO in 92, 93, 94, uh, and 2001, when, it's when most of the tariffs are supposed to come down. There's a phase-in period, but you take the point. There's like an eight, nine or so year window between uh, when China is going to ascend to full membership in the WTO and when all of this kicks in. In that little time, they see themselves as having um, a, a small window in which they can uh, create internationally competitive businesses or else. Or else what? Or else, as I've said, they've just done the work for better capitalized multinationals to sweep in and say thank you very much. So China has to go from being a place where its auto industry is, is highly decentralized thanks to Cold War ideas of what might happen if you locate all of your uh, industry in one easily nuked location um, uh, all over the place. There's a terrific book by a British guy, I think he's British, um, uh, Mr. China. Anyone read that? It's about a, you know, a venture capitalist type basically looking around. He's got all this huge amounts of money he's got to invest somewhere. Uh, and he, go, he gives a great description of going off to one of these automobile, automotive plants. I forget where it was. Anhui, somewhere relatively uh, remote. Uh, the point being, uh, what, what I'm using that point to illustrate is how there's this teeny window of eight or so years when, uh, when the Chinese state has to re-centralize all of that and create economies of scale so that it can compete against the big uh, boys. It can still tweak, it can still tweak uh, the nature of co a cooperative agreements between GM or any other Detroit or Japanese auto manufacturer in order to get them to transfer capital and know-how into China without Giving, a, giving away permanently um, those higher ends of the value chain, remember why that's important for any number of reasons, economic and political, um, uh, to uh, foreigners. So I see, I, I, I don't, I see the WTO then as playing a critical role, or uh, imminent membership in the WTO as playing a critical role in saying, we can't mess around anymore with all these small and mom and pop shops. We need to centralize all of these to create well-capitalized, well-run, ideally international competitive um, industries um, or else. What are the impacts? What are the impacts of this? Well, the impacts are visible in every city across China. These numbers are out of date. I mean, it's changed so quickly, it's barely worth it. Unless I had a digital you know, number rolling, the amount of uh, cars bought on there. A couple of years ago, you remember this story of the 100-kilometer-long traffic jam in China. Uh, I had a special term for that in China. It was called Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> no, in other words, I, I, I've been on that road. I think it's the one leading to the Datong, one of these coal-rich uh, coal areas, or on the road to the coal-rich areas, um, where, yeah, it was kind of like that uh, quite a bit. So horrible traffic jams. Uh, all sorts of other uh, personal health consequences. One third of China has acid rain. So much of that acid rain is produced by uh, uh, cars. 
Uh, so I put a few of those impacts up there. China now over imports over 50%. That number changed. I mean, I started researching this eight years ago now. It was 30-something percent, and like practically every time I give a talk, I have to tweak the number upward. Way over 50% is the danger zone uh, for people in politics, for a too, too reliant. Um, uh, it's already over that. Uh, lots of predictions about how much worse it's going to be. Think of all the global repercussions of this. When I started midway through the writing, the uh, Gulf uh, BP disaster occurred in the United States. It's not hard to imagine what that would have been like if instead of... Uh, I'm trying to think what the term for the guy running BP at the time was. That's not vulgar. Um, fortunately, I pick up these British expressions that I'm told are vulgar. In any case, this seemingly uh, qu uh, stereotypical, uh, effete, upper-class British guy. Uh, imagine in place of him and how much Americans had problems with this guy going yachting while uh, most, of the, uh, most of the Gulf Coast is suffering. If it's instead some Chinese guy with broken English... You know, you could imagine the Fu Manchu-like stereotypes or whatever. Well, you won't, I don't think you're going to have to imagine them for very long, given the growth uh, of Chinese uh, petroleum exploration. It, there will be those kind of disasters, uh, and Chinese will be in control of them. Think of all the kind of consequences of that. The same kind of unsavory relationships we're forced into, the Chinese are into. This last one is maybe the most important and interesting one. I'm part of an Oslo-based group looking at the adaptation of green technologies in automotive and power industries. And they're very excited about China because uh, um, of all that push towards uh, green technologies uh, in Chinese automotive. Um, I think it's, easier to, it's easy to think about why China has a huge vested interest in developing the electric car industry. Um, it's not because the air is so unbelievably polluted that uh, we learned recently embassies have to measure it and the Chinese government is unhappy about that. It's not because they care about, well, they may care about that, but for me that's much less important than those two other things. That is the geopolitics of being so reliant on imported oil when you have quite a, few, a lot of coal. Most 70% or more of Chinese uh, electricity is generated by coal. So if they switch from internal combustion engines to electric, they're essentially switching from imported oil to um, coal. Uh, so the first of these is the geopolitical considerations. The second is those economic ones. As I mentioned, they need to move up the value chains for the chain for the next round of economic growth in China. Um, if, they, uh, if they don't, they'll have not only a sputtering economy and be caught in that middle income trap and all the other things that uh, people uh, predict, uh, but they'll also have those political problems of those millions of of now I got my college degree but can't find a job types, not getting a job. So those two considerations alone over-determine that China isn't going to get people to drive electric cars uh, nicely. Um, they're going to push them in that direction. Um, I think there was an article by a, a reporter that I otherwise greatly admire about how um, electric cars are failing in China. Uh, the prices are too high, there's not enough recharging stations, the battery technology, anyone even vaguely familiar with uh, EVs knows what, the, knows what the problem is, and the problems are considerable. I think that's, if you look at even the, not even long term, you look at the development of the auto industry in China, and just the way I've suggested that people were more or less forced into uh, relying on cars, uh, and how deeply entrenched a part of Chinese culture and economy that now is, with two million plus people, uh, working in Chinese car industries, you're going to see the same sort of push uh, into uh, EVs. Along the way, that may help some of the rest of us, especially if we get our electricity from somewhere else, um, other than burning uh, this type of coal that China burns. But in the meantime, um, I'm not so sure it's going to be the solution that we're looking for. So the point that I'm trying to make with all of this about cars is that China uh, not only... Uh, is not only created an, uh, an export industry, but also a car culture that is the infrastructure of desire. What do I mean by all that kind of vaguely academic gobbledygook? I mean that what was done onto China, ma mainly that we forced, a, we forced uh, China to have a car culture and economy, they're now doing for the rest of the world for the same reasons we did. Massive overcapacity means that they need to find other export markets for cars. 
And in order to find those markets, they're willing to help build roads and do all the other things, bribe politicians, whatever, in order to facilitate the export of those cars uh, to other places. So yes, maybe some of those things will be green cars. We already have seen China race ahead in two-wheeled EVs, two-wheeled electric vehicles. It's pretty startling in the streets of China how quickly that's, for those of you who go to China periodically, uh, it used to be safe to cross the street because those bicycles and everything else was so noisy. Dude, I can't, re- lost track of the number of times I've almost been hit. I also think that, I mentioned that gateway cars, that this is, once you get people in cheap cars, then they want more expensive cars, and more expensive cars beyond that, and usually these more expensive cars uh, consume more energy and have other related problems. So what I'm trying to suggest then um, is that uh, China is not only driving, saving the world on the one hand economically, but also creating massive uh, problems on the other, other. I've uh, outlined a couple of those problems where I think the environmental ones are worth dwelling on. And that I think everybody who's even vaguely familiar with China knows that there are environmental problems there. I sure was. But in compiling that chapter, or writing that chapter, or putting the dots together of how many different environmental problems that they're dealing with simultaneously um, all adds up to a grim picture. Uh, because I spoke to uh, uh, a lot of um, business crowds over the years, and they didn't just want doom and gloom, which is, my, again, my personality, there's lots of positive, I suppose, takeaways from all of this. I think the Chinese, uh, obviously, the demand part is going to be good for business. I think Chinese competition and branding categories meant that, much like what the Japanese did, they'll start to create brands that will become internationally competitive, not just because the Chinese state... Um, has created artificial barriers to make sure that they have entry entryway into the market, uh, but also because they're better quality or lower price. So from the point of view of the consumer, uh, China could make global markets much more efficient. Uh, they could make them much more satisfying because your options are better and cheaper. Um, I'm just afraid that the cost will be pretty high. Uh, so right, in any case, as an historian, I guess I should end up with the historical note that uh, China has come a long way. There I am, they're getting my haircut. Uh, from this land of the terrible haircut to this uh, land of the excellent haircut uh, with some implications, not all of them positive. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to our uh, discussion.